Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. So today we are going to be talking about um, system strategies or strategies for organizations working in complex systems. And I sent a little bit of blurb about it in the invitation. Um, but I'll go through it in more detail now. And as always, feel free to um, ask me questions or just jump in or stick your hand up or put stuff in the chat. I'll open my little chat window now so I can kind of see what's going on. But feel free to talk to each other. And some of you will have done some of this stuff. I imagine most of you will be familiar with aspects of this. Um, it's not a panacea. And I will leave it up to you to decide how or, how, or to what extent it relates to your own organizations. Um, but if, you know, if that's an area of interest, then pop your hand up and we'll have a chat about it. Because um, if it's relevant to you, it'll be relevant to other people. Um, and also, you know, just to say there are other tried and tested strategy models than sort of going the full hog and doing, you know, the systems based strategy. Um, and I think when I first, you know, sort of lab mission, when I first I was just telling, telling Nikki this about an hour ago, um, when I first started working in the nonprofit sector, so, you know, my consulting background and my professional background is all in the business sector. Um, I did a piece of work for an organization. It was strategy development. And we used the kind of standard strategy development process, which, which you know, historically has been designed really for competitive organizations operating in fairly static markets. You know, that's, that's where all of our strategy philosophy comes from. You know, all the sort of big thinkers in the 50s, 60s, 70s that laid the groundwork for things like Pestle and, and SWAT and all that stuff. That's what it's all for. It's for that kind of environment. And we went through the process and we got to the end and they were very happy with the strategy around, you know, what kind of services and where they should invest and where they should grow and where they should withdraw and that sort of thing. Um, and we were going through the kind of final conversation and one of the trustees asked, well, where's partnerships in this? Where's partnerships in this strategy? Um, and I, I felt a little bit like um, sort of Laplace, the mathematician, when he was talking to Napoleon. Napoleon was asking about this maths book that he'd written. And Napoleon was saying, where's God in your maths book? Where's God in all of this book that you've written about, about the universe? And he said, Laplace apparently said, anecdotally, I didn't need that hypothesis in order for my equations to work, so I didn't include it. And it kind of struck me that a lot of, Nonprofits, and you will probably be familiar with this. You you kind of got in your sort of activity plan. You've got partnerships. You've probably got community engagement, that sort of thing. And what happens quite often is it's it's a bit peripheral. And when the pressure's on, and when time gets short, and money starts to run out, you start to withdraw from those sort of things because they're quite time consuming and that sort of thing. Um, because they tend not to be at the heart of your strategy. The heart of your strategy tends to be about your organization, its model and its expansion and reach and that sort of thing. Um, so, so quite often we will sort of walk away from those things. And, and, you know, the same is true from systems strategies. People kind of pick this up. You get quite a lot of it in local authorities. Again, it was an earlier conversation earlier today, um, talking about, you know, a, a local authority commissioning services and, and they've got all these kind of buzzwords, asset-based commissioning in their heads, and they want to do this sort of stuff. So they engage with a number of providers and, and have you know, a series of meetings over a couple of months to talk about, you know, how can we redesign the system so it's much more effective and more inclusive and makes use of assets. And, that. and after about three months of those conversations, they, they realized it was just too complicated for them. And they just gave a question to the providers and said, you know, you sort it out and you come to us with your proposal. And obviously that proposal had a big price tag attached and, the conversation just kind of died. Um, and that's not unusual because in order to, to really make this stuff happen, it has to be the foundation stone of your strategy. It has to be right at the core of it. And it's very rare that you start our strategy processes with this sort of thing. And it's very rare that organizations like local authorities can really engage with this stuff for the reasons that we'll see as I go through, in terms of leading it anyway, it's rare they can do it. They can, but it's rare. There's, there are some examples, um, but it's rare. So long and short of it, this is not, I guess, for the faint-hearted to sort of bite this off and say this, this is the future of our, the way that we're going to think and the way that we're going to think about strategy in particular, but also the way that we think about our organisation because it will influence the way that you see the purpose of your organisation if you start to go through these processes. Um 
So it isn't for the faint heart, but it doesn't have to be a leap into the dark. It can be something that you start, as long as you're committed to it, you can start and explore it. And then you will start to understand how you can create a strategy that will transition from where you currently are into a more systemic sort of view of the world. Before I get into that, I thought it would be useful just to kind of give you my kind of top three rationales for this, if there is such a thing as rationales. Um, so there are three reasons why you should probably be thinking about this. And I've got some little pictures. Um, and these are the reasons why people tend to come to me and get into this space to start off with. So the first one is, is what I call, I'm just going to share a screen with you, what I call the ladder of whys. Um, it comes from the, the question of should we, should we be doing more? Should we be taking a more holistic view about you know, the lives of our beneficiaries or our communities or our service users, et cetera. And it tends to go in this way. So we'll start off, it opens up a much bigger cone of potential. Um, so we start off asking the questions around, you know, so what is it that you do as an organization? Well, typically we run services that attract state funding. You can imagine, you know, this probably won't be relevant for all of yours, but some, you know, some organizations um, say it might be learning disability or autism or, or blindness or something, sight loss, something like that. Um, so typically an organization will run services that get funded. And if your strategy starts with that scope, you will look at other services that, that might attract funding. If you expand that scope, so ask the question, why do we do that? Because we want to support interventions for these people that will help them. And, and therefore, some of those will be state funded, some might be commercially funded, some might be fundraising. So you're opening the scope, it gives you a much broader, the next level above that might be about, you know, we want we actually want to see positive enabling communities where within which the, our, our, our chosen cohort of people can thrive, which will necessarily include some support and interventions, some of which may be services, but it's about building that community because that's the best for environment. And the, you know, the higher scope area is actually we want to create a world in which or, a, you know, a country in which the, this, these kind of outcomes can be the norm for people. And that will involve some and it will involve some, et cetera, et cetera. And that really expands the scope of what you as an organization will therefore consider within your strategy. And that starts to lead you towards thinking about systemic change. So that's one way into this. But if you... If you want to expand the scope of your organization and move to a more holistic sort of outcomes-based way of thinking, you will lean into sort of system strategy work. The second bit is, and I'll just sort of touch on this, a lot of what we, what we get to when we sort of follow that ladder of whys is the nature of complexity. So I'm going to sort of just drop a couple of, sort of um, examples in here. This one is, uh, well, the, the definition of a complex system is this. So you can see it, multiple independent influences and actors. So there's lots of different actors and factors involved in creating an outcome. That might be a global, national, local, or individual level. I'll give you an example in a second. Um, they are variable. And there, there's a dynamic interrelationship between these different factors. So you push on one and you know, another one changes, et cetera. There's inherent unpredictability about it because it's complex and the outcome is emergent. And the example that I'll give you is, is this one, because I think it's a lovely piece of research that led to this. And it's also a really interesting case study about how it didn't really work. Um, so this is you know, giving you the spoiler. I've turned to the back page of the story already. Um, so this is, the, the, you'll see the picture there, that it, the government um, commissioned, this is going way back about 14, 15 years, and the government commissioned the Foresight Group to, um, to, to help it answer the question, how do we reduce obesity by 2040? I think the date was, you know, how do we reduce the population level of obesity? Because obesity is, you know, was and still is a growing problem within developed nations, certainly within the UK. Um, and the group, you know, there are obvious, the, there are the sort of obvious kind of shortcuts. You know, obesity is uh, the difference between how many calories you eat and how many calories you burn, and this sort of thing. And I think somebody was on, who was it? Wrote, it could have been Matthew Paris that fat shaming should come back because it worked for smokers. <clears throat> this report just, you know, blows that out of the water. There are 114 different factors. This is really extensive research that all contribute dynamically 
to this emergent outcome of population level obesity. And they're to do with food, pro food production, food consumption, psychology, particularly sort of mental health, um, and, you know, the, the pressures that you're under at work, the, the, the availability of exercise around you, whether your job is very sort of sedate, all of these things are massive factors in it. It's not just simply, you know, people should jog more. Um, so this report came out and it suggested to the, the who commissioned it, which was the DCMS and Department of Health, um, that you needed to take a systemic approach, a system-wide system approach to solving this problem. Um, and as it happened, the, the Department of Health picked it up. I think DCMS said, there you go, Department of Health, you go and look after it. So the Department of Health passed it down to the strategic health authorities, um, none of whom have a remit or any influence on most of this. So what they did was they commissioned um, a whole bunch of weight loss programs from Weight Watchers and um, Slim as well and that sort of thing. And, and to be fair, a, a lot of obese people lost a lot of weight um, and everybody ticked their little boxes and all the interventions were successful and people got paid the, you know, their commissioned contracts and people lost weight. But all at the same time, the national level of obesity continues to rise because this was just, you know, tip of the iceberg stuff. And you could make the same argument about, um, you know, an organization whose remit is to help people with autism into employment. You know, there's 700,000 people in the UK with autism who don't have a job, who would want a job, well, probably I think, think about 80% of them would want a job and probably could hold down a decent job as well. Um, and there are enough, a number of organizations who work with um, people with autism to take them on an apprenticeship pipeline and, and get them in there. But, but the best will in the world, you're looking at, you know, tens, possibly hundreds of people a year, not 500, 700,000 in order to achieve that level of change. It is the system. It's the way that employers think about employment. It's the environment. It's the education system. It's the whole process would need to be different to create an outcome which is sustainable and scalable. So this is what we mean by complex problems. Uh, many of which, when you look at, you know, vision statements from our, our large charities and maybe some of yours, what they actually have them, you know, are just love without poverty, a society that works for autistic people. These are the emergent outcomes of often very complex systems that will have very different factors for individuals. So my autistic child will be, you know, probably exposed to similar factors to your autistic child, if you have one. I mean, I have two, but, but, um, but as they grow older as an adult, those factors will change. And the ones that have the greatest weight on their, you know, on their outcomes will shift. So, you know, education will be very important when they're younger, much less important when they're older, et cetera. So these are a lot, loads of factors in there, loads of other organizations at play. It's complex and evolving system, and it's different at different life stages. What's what we mean by dynamic um, and emergent outcomes. So this is why you know, a lot of organizations get to this through either that sort of hierarchy of whys or um, through, you know, through actually taking their vision seriously, going back to their vision and thinking, so therefore, what do we need to do? Sometimes, I'll just take that off for a second so I can see you all again. That was just a sort of quick tour around. But sometimes it also emerges where, and I have to speak to um, Petra's old organization here. Um, that was probably the first organization where I got a real sense of what, what a map for systems change could look like in a very sort of simple way, simple and elegant and quite effective as well, which was um, working animals in this case. And the idea that, you could have you could set up your you know free veterinary clinic in a community in in Egypt or in Alaska or wherever that will you know whether it's working dogs in 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 you know sort of in the ice fields or whether it's working donkeys in Cairo the the situation is the same you you want to help those animals you set up your free veterinary clinic the the owners bring the animals to the clinic they get patched up and then they go back into a similar environment to to where they've been before and you know similar sort of outcomes happen you're not changing anything um but actually the, the petra's organization they they pulled together a broad theory of change influenced i think historically by the way that um, international development charities were going at the time um which which looked at what are the main sort of prerequisites for a for a deeper more sustainable outcome 
which is to do with a, a change in attitude of the owners, a change in skill and capability and awareness of the people that actually look after the animals, a change in terms of the availability of the technical help, whether it's sort of farriers or whether it's vets, et cetera, you know, the, the fact that they are available, and a change in sort of the, the cultural belief system or, or the legal framework that sort of the, the authority that tells people how they should be behaving around animals. Um, and they beautiful sort of diagram of these four main areas, obviously a lot of complexity in each, in each of those. Um, but one thing that became apparent was that one of the, one of the downsides of offering a free vet service in a place like, you know, like that is it creates a dependency. It creates uh, an inability for, for that, that piece of the jigsaw to present itself. So no other vets can open, no, you know, if you, as long as you're given free services, you, there is no competition, nobody else can come in there. So it's not gonna be sustainable until you pull out, in which case you leave a vacuum. Um, so, so one of the things that sometimes triggers people to start thinking more systemically is the recognition that actually, if you want to be able to scale, to be able to solve a problem and then move, you probably need to look at the sort of systemic in fact, rather than going in there with an intervention that creates the dependency, fixes the problem, and then go go away, and that problem then reemerges, it's a more sort of systemic approach. So those are the kind of rationales why why I see people wanting to sort of take much more interest in this 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 here. You know, either people want to expand to a more holistic approach to create change, something which is beyond the narrow sphere in which they've probably sort of found themselves historically. The second one is because the, the priority of the vision is more important to you as a leader than maintaining the, the sort of delivery model that you've got, because there's often a challenge between those two. And the third one is that the current system seems to have interventions that actually conflict with the vision or create dependency within it. That everybody feels good, feels, you know, feel like we're doing a great job, but actually we are definitely no closer, in fact, maybe further away from solving this, this big problem that we've hitched our vision to. So those are the, the reasons why I find that people go into this, this sort of area. And I think they're, they're really valid. And if those reasons apply to you, then this is probably something for you in terms of your organization to think your way into. Um, what I'll, I'll just talk about then. So if anybody's got any questions, by the way, just shout up. Because <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to stop unless you stop me. But I'm happy to stop if you do. Rosie, were you going to come in? <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry, you looked like you were. Um, okay, well, I'll carry on until you stop me. So if I talk about sort of three areas, really, one is the sort of philosophy of this. So if you take systems um, strategy seriously and you take it to heart, what does that mean in terms of mindset and philosophy for developing your strategy in the way that you see your organisation? The second thing I'll talk about is the approach. So how do you, in practice, how do you actually go about developing a strategy based on an emergent outcome of a complex system? And then the third one I will talk about is, is really around the key concepts and the language because it's very confused and it's very confusing. Um, and I think it's really helpful to, to get yourself clear on what you mean by these things. And I'll give you a sense of what I mean by these things and and. You know, there may be questions and conversations around those. So the first thing that I'll talk about then is, is um, the philosophy, <clears throat> because it is a little bit scary. It requires a shift in mindset, I think, um, that builds from kind of one step to the, to the next, one conceptual step to the, to the next. So the first kind of conceptual step, I think, is, um, is around the way that you rethink your organization goals. So rather than setting your strategic goals as being achievable KPIs, like the number of people that you reach or the amount of money that you make and those sort of things, which, which are potentially within your gift and you can potentially as an executive team, you can see a way to achieve them. You're gonna be setting your strategic goals based on something that you can't achieve yourself on your own. So uh, you, your goal might be the level of obesity. Your goal might be, the global politi um, poverty index. You know, this is kind of what Oxfam have done. They've, they've you know, dollar a day is their measure or, or whatever it is, you know, the absolute poverty measure. And they will measure it globally, 20%, 30%. Um, 
And that's a really scary thing to do, to actually set your goals seriously, the way that you'll measure yourself on something which is largely beyond your control, but which you're going to set out to try and use all sorts of ways to influence, to, to achieve. But that's at the heart of this. What's one of the first steps is to seriously set a goal that is in that emergent outcome space that you want to achieve. So that's kind of, you know, mindset shift number one. The second mindset shift that I, I see is, is rethinking impact, rethinking what your impact is from direct impact to indirect impact, but also from impact as you would like to see it to incremental impact, which is not necessarily as pretty picture. And I'll just sort of explain that very briefly. So the way I term incremental impact is what difference does it make you being there versus you not being there? Now, for some of you in the places that you operate, if you weren't there, there would be a complete gap and all of the impact that you currently have would disappear. But for most of you, if you weren't there, if you disappeared tomorrow, within a month, another organization would be doing pretty much what you'd be doing. Maybe not as well, maybe not everywhere, but they will be doing a lot of the stuff that you're doing. The incremental impact in that case that you have is the difference that you make versus what somebody else would make. If you're in commissioned services, that difference can be, quite frankly, can be zero. Your incremental impact can actually be zero. It can be negative because another person could have won that contract that would actually deliver slightly better outcomes than you. You know, I'm sure all of you would be uh, positive in terms of your incremental impact. But that's what I mean by incremental impact. And that's the mindset shift that because one of the processes that you go through in systems thinking is trying to understand where do we make the biggest difference? Where can we make the biggest difference? What can we do that nobody else can do? And if all you're doing is the stuff that somebody else can do, maybe marginally better, that means your incremental impact on that space, you know, maybe paying a huge amount of effort into it, your incremental impact is marginal, whereas there's another area that nobody's doing that you could do that would make a dramatic difference. So that's what I mean by kind of rethinking impact. The third sort of mindset shift that then follows from those. So if you if you're willing to to hold this thing that we're we're actually not going for our own KPIs, we're going for a system level outcome, and that we are able to think about impact in a way which is what is the incremental impact that we do. What that tends to then lead to is a, a shift in terms of what you think of your mission. Your mission, rather than delivering a set of services that you've historically delivered, your mission often moves completely because you're a servant of those goals in a complex context where there are other players in the landscape. So that often means you want to rethink your mission in terms of, so therefore, what are we going to do that has the most impact? What are the gaps that we're going to plug? And we might withdraw from certain areas, which leads you to the fourth mindset shift, which is that everything that you currently do before you start this process has to be considered as disposable. This, what you did, the, the services that you offer, et cetera, they are the best way that you had found up until now of having impact. As you go through this process, you may question whether those services are still appropriate, whether they're the right ones, whether they're positive, whether they have you know, unintended negative consequences, whether they create dependencies, et cetera. Not that you were going to, you know, you're not suddenly going to run away after two weeks and go, right, that's it. We're not doing any of this. But what you will find is the, the, the scope for you to explore, the spaces for you to start to really understand. And potentially what will emerge from there is a sense of strategically, we want to transition from where we are now to something which is quite radically different. But one of the going in points from, for, for this is that everything that we currently do we could stop doing if we needed to, if, if the answer that emerged from the strategy was to stop doing that, that would be fine. And it really is about the primacy of vision over the current model that you've historically operated. So, so that's the philosophy and it can be a little bit scary. You don't necessarily have to sell it into your trustees and your executive all at once, but if you start to go on this journey and you start to explore some of these areas, that's probably the, the thing that you're going to have to sell in. So that makes sense. I know some of you've been on this journey before. Is that that will sound normal? I'm teaching you stuff which you already know, 
or is this interesting and useful? Nods. I'll take that as interesting and useful. Feel free to speak, by the way. I know there's quite a few people on the call, but you can speak. Okay. So let me go on and then I'll just touch on the approach. Um, so how do you actually go about doing this? Um, interesting and useful for me. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Oh, I love it. Keep the comments coming. I can read them. Uh, <laughs> stroke my ego. Um, so the approach, how do you go about doing this? It, I think the simplest way to explain it is to think about a series of interrelated questions, which means that you'll answer a question and then you'll try and answer the next question. That may sort of influence the question before, but it's, it's more likely to build and build. So question number one would be to answer that question, you know, going up through the ladder of whys or starting with your vision. What is the world or the ideal that you want to see? That's the kind of emergent outcome. How does that get framed in a measurable, realizable way? So if we go back to those examples of, of organizations and their strategies, um, sorry, their vision statements, if I can find it. Here, I'll just put that back up on the screen so you can see it. Some of these lend themselves better to the starting point for a strategy than others. So Oxfam's, I would say, is gold standard in terms of the fact that you see, theoretically, it's a realizable vision. It might be very difficult to achieve, but they know what poverty means. They have a definition for it. It might not be the definition we'd all share, but they have it defined. And they know that they can measure it. And they've got a sense of how it might come about, what might need to exist in a world for a world without poverty. Just, that is a just world. I mean, just is probably a little bit more ambiguous in terms of its meaning. But as a, as a vision, it's realizable, potentially measurable. It is a good starting point for a more systemic approach to strategy. Where you've got a little bit further down, Age UKs, for example, this is not having to go at anybody's, but you know, a society in which everyone can enjoy a long and fulfilled life. That's a bit of a big piece, you know, that sort of um that's child mortality and um uh, sort of adolescent mental health, and there's a whole load of stuff that would need to change, which is probably not really what age UK mean when they use that descriptor. So it's not as helpful as it could be. Um, the, the National Autistic Society is one, for example, a society that works for autistic people. It's not as measurable as it could be. It would need to have some stuff behind it so that we understood what does that mean? What is it? What is the outcome that we would measure there? What were the definition around that? So you can get a sense of you know, your, your vision statement, your starting point, your first question, the world, the ideal that you would want to see this emergent outcome, how quantifiable is it? How realizable is it? How achievable sort of theoretically, forget about the practicality, but theoretically, how achievable might that be? So therefore, is it fit for purpose for this sort of systemic, systemic approach? The second question is, therefore, what would need to change or to exist for that to be realized? And there's a number of ways that you can get into to actually really sort of understanding that question. Um, quite often, I think the, probably the most successful approaches that I've seen is where certainly where it's dealing with people, where it's dealing with animals, I think it's probably different, but where it's dealing with people is to start with the lived experience, to start with working with cohorts of people who are in the situation, who are going through it, to understand the language that they use. When you ask questions like, you know, does this, does this vision work for you? Do these words work for you? Or would you phrase it in a different way? Is it meaningful for you? And, and once you get to a set of words that they buy into, then what is your experience around that? What, is the, what does that mean for you? Can you break it down for us and say, you know, so, uh, so for instance, a, a society that works for autistic people or, you know, being able to live the life that you want to lead, what does that mean? And when you, when you listen to different cohorts of people talk around that, often the similar things emerge. So it will often be, you know, to be able to have relationships, to be able to live somewhere that, that I feel safe and happy, um, to be able to pursue my interests, to be able to have a job, you know, something purposeful and meaningful, et cetera. So you get those kind of half dozen big chunks of stuff that come out from those conversations. And, you know, it may be, it may be then that you need to have a conversation with, with people who work 
with those cohorts quite a lot to really interpret that and understand it at a sort of systemic level as opposed to you know 20 40 50 people's verbatim accounts um in the example from petrus world that i don't think they talk to donkeys to get this but i think they you know they spent time with people who have lived and worked in those environments and got a real feel for what the prerequisites are in order for these successful outcomes to happen so you're trying to pull these together but as much as possible with people you're trying to build through the the words and the language that they use to create this model and it might be a theory of change i tend to steer clear of that theory of change tends to be used as a and this is where we start to get into language theory of change tends to be used as a description almost like a linear description that you know we do this input and then we get this impact and then we get this outcome and then we etc um whereas complex systems tend to not lend themselves to that sort of linear model and that's i think that's so that's probably why i steer steer away from using the, the phrase theory of change because of the image it conjures up but it, it is technically a theory a hypothesis that you're trying to build here some kind of map whether it's as complex as that obesity one or whether it's a simple kind of four or five prerequisites whatever it is whatever suits its purpose for you to be able to capture this and share it so that you've got some kind of logical construct to say this is how we believe this outcome emerges these are the changes that would need to happen and then the third question is so therefore, what is the role of your organization? What is the best role? What are the, what, are, what is the combination of things? What are the things that you are best positioned to do? And I'll give you an example of that before I move on. So um, I often use this as a, as a guide, as a way of explaining. Um, so I've got here a, a, a chart, which has got basically four different, you know, the kind of numbers, one, two, three, four, service provision is a role that an organization plays. And many of your organizations will play this. You do stuff, whether that's paid for by fundraising or paid for by the state or paid for by, you know, legacy or, or another organization or, or commercially done. Most charities spend most of their energy on service provision. Some also spend their energy on innovation. And some feed that back into their service provision, but they do it consciously, but some then make that innovation available. So for example, if I was to look at sort of, you know, NSPCC, they used to do lots of service provision. Now they tend to be much more kind of in the innovation and the research and trying to get their technical expertise out to other organizations, whether that's organizations in the nonprofit sector working with children or whether that's delivery drivers to, to know, to look for signs of, of, children who have been abused or, or you know, diff, tricky situations that should be flagged up. Um, and other organizations may, so, so for instance, going back to that, um, that example of you know, autism and employment, the, the service provision is, is running the, um, the, the apprenticeship schemes. Innovation is finding out new ways of doing things that could impact this and then sharing it with other organizations that run apprenticeship schemes. The technical expertise would be working with employers to help them create an environment within which autistic people can thrive or a process through which autistic people can achieve employment. And the fourth one is policy and influence, which is probably the, the route you'd have to go to influence the education system itself. And you'll see each of these, the, the reach is, is, you know, is bigger. So I'm not telling you anything I'm sure you don't know, but you know, your reach through policy is potentially nationwide. Your reach through passing your technical expertise into the commercial sector could be far bigger than you would have doing your own services, et cetera. But the distance you have, because you start to work through intermediaries, you start to work through, you know, public opinion, the distance you have, your ability to actually quantify your impact becomes much harder, which is why a lot of charities historically have sort of steered away from it because you can't put numbers on it very easily. You can't see what bit was yours. You want to brand it ours. Whereas actually a lot of this stuff happens best in, in collaboration. Um, but there are great examples historically of nonprofit sector organizations doing all four of those. But there is a fifth role and some organizations specialize in this, which is the research side of things. If you look at um, British Asian Trust, it's a great example with what they've been doing, their development impact bond, in India, I think it is I'm sure it's in India on girls' education. Um, they've got role number six funders, Dell Foundation, um, Bill and Melinda Gates, got about 10 foundations that have put up a, a bond. I think UBS investment, UBS venture, um, actually put up the money. 
um, for you know, I don't know if you know how development bonds work. I won't go into the detail, but they put up the money on on the condition that if all the targets were hit, then all these foundations would pay would pay back the loan with the five percent premium. Um, and within that huge collaboration that British Asian um, Trust convened, really, they didn't do any of the service provision. They didn't do any of the innovation. They didn't really do any of the funding. They convened funders, innovators on the ground, and service providers as well as government agencies to try and do this sort of innovation. And, and one of the parties that they brought in was a third party to specifically measure the impact and research how the process worked. So these are your kind of six classic roles within the sector. And there's a seventh one you'll see up there, which is systems leadership, which is an emerging role that's been discussed probably in academic spaces for probably about you know somewhere seven, eight years, I guess. Um, First time I came across it was, um, but actually I'll just touch on this and then I'll go into system leadership. Um, there are other ways. So this is, this is my kind of BBC thing, you know, other, other, other soft drinks are available. There are other ways of looking at roles. This is just an example that was um, one of my clients in the wildlife um, sector shared this with me from another wildlife trust, um, which was around, you know, the way that they categorized it. And you see, do it ourselves, that's service delivery. Guide and support others, that's transitioning your IP and influence and inspiring change. So they're in kind of two, three, and four, these, these well, sort of one, three, and four, service provision, technical expertise, and policy influence. What they've not talked about in terms of the roles that they could play is, is innovation, developing radical new solutions, or doing lots of research. And maybe that's right for that organization. They've picked those three. You don't have to do all these, and, and to an extent, it's probably not best that you try and do all of these because systems change tends to be a team sport and it's about really getting the right people together around it. But you may choose to, to try and lead on the systems leadership piece, um, which is <clears throat> it's called systems leadership um, in the States. It tends to be called system stewardship over here. I think that that's sort of dissipating and it tends to be called systems leadership, but it is a role. I got this from uh, Toby Lowe who's, a, as you can see there, a lecturer in public leadership and management at Northumbria University, and he was um, presenting, teaching really, at the Commissioning Academy, which is a, it's a, a development process that most commissioners in most local authorities, but also other commissioners, you know, police, ambulance, um, have been put through over the past few years. And he was one of the lecturers, and he talks to them about systems change and, and the difference between commissioning um, interventions and trying to commission across a system to create an emergent outcome. And this is what he describes as system stewardship. It's about defining a shared objective and engaging people with that. It's about building a collective will across multiple collaborations of people that want this outcome. And that's half the job in sort of his experience and probably my experience as well. Half the job is the collective. Well, after that, a lot of stuff just happens behind the scenes. But system stewardship is also about learning, learning what influences. And this is one of the things that, that he pointed out, which is, you know, is exactly the, the example with obesity and many others. Um, you know, intervention success is the easiest thing to measure, and that's why we're drawn to it. Um, increasing direct and indirect reach, the impact of our interventions, et cetera. System success is measured differently. Um, it, it's dependent on learning and engaging and collaboration, and it's measured in terms of those outcomes. And it's very easy and actually quite common to succeed in interventions while failing at the system change piece. This is, you know, it's not an unusual paradigm to see that. So this is a strategic choice. And systems leadership is, is either a role that an organization can take or an individual can take, or a collective of organizations can cover between them. But it's a defined role. Harvard Kennedy Center wrote this paper in 2019 on systems leadership for sustainable development. <clears throat> there is lots of other stuff like this out there, but it boils down to kind of similar things. It's learnings from early adopters, from people who have been through this process. Um, there's, a, there's always a sense of control. It's always a challenging thing for, for organizations to properly go into this space because it doesn't let them go. Um, the, the North Star piece is incredibly powerful. Getting a community of, of organizations or individuals who have a real shared view of what this North Star is, how you describe it. And it, it's, it's not something that you can impose on a group of other people. It's something that needs to form out of that group. Um, and the way that 
you create coordination, the size of the group, how it works, the dynamics within it, and what structures you put around it in order for that group to be functional. Um, just, you know, just my experience of facilitating, you get more than 12 people in a room and it's really difficult to have certain conversations. So how do you engineer structures, you know, even if it's just processes and facilitated workshops in order to get consensus from a larger number? So this is kind of my summary, uh, you know, from all these other different bits. I think it's my summary. I don't think I've stolen this. I may have done. Apologies if I have. But this is the kind of, you know, the system leadership role. It's about developing an understanding or some kind of representation of the system itself that can be articulated to people that says, this is why we're going to try and innovate over here and try and do, make some changes over here. You can't design a new system. It doesn't work like that. Complex systems fight back. But what you can do is design interventions in certain areas of the system and look at how the rest of the system behaves and learn how that system works, how the feedback loops work, and how you can collectively create the right emergent outcomes from it by by curating the changes within it. Um, systems leadership is about defining and engaging the outcomes and getting people to want that. It's the kind of planting the flag, really, and saying, let's all go this way. It's convening people, like, a, like the example of the British Asian Trust that I gave, creating coalitions. It's about fostering trust and openness. It's about creating an environment that's a huge part of this. It's cre creating that collaborative environment. Um, it does involve reporting. And that's why I say that, that you know, and inspiring others to join. This doesn't necessarily have to be an organization that does all of this stuff. I have seen examples where actually different organizations will lend different roles. So an organization will lead on reporting. Different people will lead on this sort of inspiring the kind of rah rah going out there and bringing new people in, et cetera, because they're just natural connectors with, with other people. Um, so, but these are the bases that need to be covered in order for a collective around systems change to be effective. So I've gone into this in a little bit of detail because I think it's sort of important to understand what are the scope of things. So when I say those first three questions, what is the world that you want to see? That's question one, you know, the emergent outcome question. What would need to change? That's the kind of model, the construct and theory type question. Do we have one? And now what is the role of my organization in this whole landscape of different actors, all these other different organizations, you know, whose toes I might step on or whatever it is. How do you coalesce that group of organizations around wanting to create change together in order to achieve these outcomes? And then once you've open, answered those first three, you start to move more into the kind of types of strategy process that you might be more familiar with. So question four is, if that's the type of organization we need to become, to be able to play this role, what are the implications for us? What are the options? What are the sort of creative strategic choices around there? And quite often those questions will iterate, this is the role that we'd like to play, but actually that would mean, you know, we would need to be a completely different organization and how feasible is that? So there's quite a lot of iteration normally in a process like this. And what normally happens is you don't come out with a five-year plan. Well, that's not what normally happens. It's what always happens. You never come out with a five-year plan because there is so much in here that actually will be new for you that you want to explore. And what you're not going to want to do is sort of just suddenly stop running your hospice or running your Red Cross services or running your ambulance. So, you know, you're not going to do those things. So some of this exploration will happen in parallel. It become core to your strategy, but you're going to continue to sort of almost run parallel strategies one with your with your legacy work and the second with your exploratory work to try and understand after you know maybe a few years what transition needs to happen where you can start to let go and where you can start to really build um momentum as a broader movement to get these sort of systemic outcomes so that's that then you know obviously sort of translates into your strategy which will be a the kind of thing that I've probably spoken to you about before, if you've been on these sessions in terms of the sort of adaptive strategy type models that has, you know, different things that run in different ways, you know, four types of project. If, if you're familiar with, if you're familiar with my oeuvre, you will know these kind of um, phrases around, you know, fog projects and quest projects and that sort of thing. And they will run on different timelines, but you will have your strategic agenda with like a portfolio of stuff. Some of which will be exploring how you create, uh, you know, a, a systems change, coalition which may or may not work some of it will maybe do a local place-based stuff some of it might be about influencing or collaboration on influencing but all of those things should emerge from 
this kind of systemic process. And what it will mean is that because your goal is the system level outcome, these things are not nice to house. They become core. They become central to what you do and they start to reshape the organization's view of what it is, what it's for, and, and you know, its purpose and potential. So those are the main kind of concepts. There's a few little bits which I will sort of pick up in terms of, you know, what, what do we mean by system? Um, what do we mean by theory? I've sort of touched on those. What do we mean by role and mission? Um, part of the reason that there's sort of confusion around those things is because of the different sources that a lot of this thinking has come from. So I mentioned before the sort of international development theory of change type models, which I think flow straight into here, but you've also got a lot of the work around health systems. So Hilary Cotton's work um, around sort of health systems and other work um, struggles to remember who, who wrote about first wrote about asset aware and asset based commissioning, but that all sort of leads into to this space. And a lot of it uses language in slightly different ways. So some people will talk about systems, you know, I was talking to, to Nikki earlier about, you know, what do we mean by system? Because if you come from a, healthcare context, quite often you will think of the system as being the healthcare system or the hospice network system. Whereas actually that's one level of thinking about it and that has meaning to you. But from a system strategy point of view, it's not the most helpful one. You can think about at that sort of, you know, the services, the system that governs services, you can think about it as, you know, I am an individual and around me there is a whole system. It's the system that I interact with, and that includes family and friends and um, you know, relatives and services and an employer, et cetera. They are all part of the system that surrounds me and creates the outcomes or allows me to have the life that I, that I have. Um, so from an individual, was it like a person-centered perspective? The system is not just the healthcare, it's, it's all of everything around it. And from a population perspective, that system will be different for different people, but it have consistent properties. So it becomes a more complex system to describe because for some people, family will be a huge influence. And for other people, you know, they, they all moved to Australia five years ago and I'm the only one here. Um, so, so this is understanding the terms that you're using and have, you know, getting clear on your language with other people, particularly. So if you want a system strategy, what is the system? The, for you what defines that what is the boundary for it how do you talk to other people about it um and understanding what your theory is going to look like is it a logic model is it a hierarchy of needs is it a linear theory of change all of those things those are the areas where i often see sort of people tripping up just in terms of sort of language differences and often it's because this stuff has emerged from from what I can see anyway, from, from so many different places that people bring a lot of heritage with the language when it, when it arrives. So I know that was a bit of a download, but what I've tried to give you is a sense of what the potential is here to think systemically and why for certain organizations in certain contexts, it's probably imperative that you do if you actually genuinely want to achieve your vision or get close to your vision in reality. And what that entails in terms of sort of mindset shifts and letting go of stuff and how it manifests in terms of a strategy process around those sort of five interrelated questions. And that's a gross simplification, but that's broadly how you work through it and what you end up with in terms of that the very multifaceted strategy of there are certain things that you've planned and you, you can carry on and doing, you know exactly what you're doing. And there are other things that are just very exploratory and could go any which way. And you would manage all those projects quite differently. So it creates a complexity within the organization, but it gives you space to be really agile, the learning organization, et cetera. Um, so those are the, the main messages that I wanted to share with you. We've got about 10 minutes left. I would be really interested in knowing what made sense, <laughs> where have you got questions, and how useful could this be? How, how relevant could it be to your organization? So wave your hands if you want to come in or just just unmute and talk james thanks Martin. i might not answer your question i mean fascinating uh, <laughs> stuff and uh, you never uh, do you never do and, don't worry. um you know loads of things there and i think we've arrived at bits of that by accident rather than um you know on purpose i suppose i was just going to share something which i might have shared i think once before with a couple of people on the call but 
in terms of our own process and which was really helpful and it goes back to your point about um visions and strategies so when we did our long-term strategy process a couple of years ago you know we started off very much thinking about where do we want to go as an organization we, we consulted on a draft strategy that said something like every child should have a stay in yha by by 2030 we thought yeah this is great and we consulted on it and people said well first of all that's impossible and and secondly it's really selfish mm -hmm. why should they stay there what are you trying to achieve with that and who else does it you know and we thought yeah that's that's right isn't it so so the final version of our strategy basically was about every child having access to you know uh, nature culture the outdoors and adventure and the key words were in that we said why actually we'll work with others to ensure that and those five words have been amazingly powerful because, first of all, it meant that when 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 we're talking to the board about what you know what, what things we might do, it opened up the whole partnerships and collaboration space to being absolutely core to achieve our our vision. It also meant that the partners who we were working with could see it was part of you know it opened it up to them as well um, because they weren't contributing to something that was all about another organisation. Whereas if it had just been our vision, well, why should we contribute to your vision? We want to contribute to a shared vision. So it helped that way too. Um, and then when it came to sort of impact measurements, just as you were saying, you know, we've just finished a collaboration in that space. Uh, you know, some people know if Angela's on the call, Generation Green, which is all about working together, public and charity collaboration to do so. And we've been able, the board are happy with us measuring the collective impact because that's fundamentally part of our strategy is collective impact so it's you know it's, it's solved a whole lot of difficult debates about are they are are they our outcome are they our impacts or your impact you know so, so we, can we kind of got rid of that because it's not so I, th I suppose so that's been really interesting and i think i think it's also helped with individual bilateral collaborations because um you know again we we've got the do you mind if it's our programs that are running from your youth hospital well, no we don't because if it's ultimately about um you know, uh, we're working with others to ensure every child has access to adventure. If, if you're in that space, then great. So actually, it's just cut through a whole load of sort of difficult debates that got in the way of partnership. So I didn't realise all that when we, uh, you know, three years ago when we we set that. But I just, I suppose it's, I just thought I'd be giving a practical example of just how powerful adding those five words we will work with others to and having an outcome at the end of it have turned out to be in in in, in you know three years down the line. And I think it also shows, thank you for sharing that. And I think it also shows that this is, again, it's it's not something that you have to throw yourself into and bite off completely. Because what you've got there, James, is you've got this transition almost potentially from historically, we are a youth hostel organisation, we run youth hostels, so we are an organisation that enables young people to experience nature and adventure. And those two things sort of have an overlap, but they don't necessarily need to. But also the, the question that it will then raise, and I don't know where you are in your journey towards kind of really embracing the system side of things or whether you need to, but, you know, what percentage of children now have right. that access? You know, what's, yep. your, what's your big global number? Yep. Yep. And what do you think of the two or three things over the next few years that need to fundamental change within society in order for that number to shift? Yeah, yeah. And, and without hogging it, I mean, just, I mean, that, and that's a conversation government's really interested in. Because there's a, you know, you can align to visions around every child having a night under the stars, which is a government, of, you know, a commitment, broadly speaking. So I think you're absolutely right. So it, back to your, your, you know, four or five different areas you can influence. It helps you then with your policy and influencing space. And because, fun, you know, because you can then work with others to work out the answer to that kind of question um, and get closer to a, a to, to a, an answer at scale that's of interest to government nationally than you could be if you're just presenting your own analysis. Now, I mean, I, you know, everyone's different, but I suppose I, I've been really surprised um, about, I mean, there's lots of the system stuff that we haven't done, but I think we've probably, we was that first piece around strategy that really, uh, we almost we almost came into it accidentally through the consultation on our strategy, but I think it's been really helpful. It is a lot, of, it is an accidental journey for a lot of people. Kate? Yeah, I think a lot of what you've said really chimes with me, Martin. And I think our experience um, just drafting our new strategy actually is that, again, I would I would reiterate what James said about 
from an internal comms perspective, being really intentional about partnership has actually been really helpful in moving the dial for people in the organisation to give them permission to look for those opportunities. But the other thing I was going to comment on is that actually I think um, sometimes in the past we've been reluctant to try and take that leadership role because we've wondered if we've had the mandate to do it. But actually, uh, with some of the engagement we did as part of the kind of strategy development with some of our stakeholders, we were being told, well, actually, we want you to do this. And I think um, I, I think sometimes charities can feel, certainly in the health space at least, uh, you know, I speak as a hospice, I think we can feel like the big organisations have to take the leadership role when actually... Um, there's a recognition, I think, that they want different kind of thinking, certainly in the new integrated care systems, and that they're only going to get that if they get other people also working in that space. So I think it's, um, I don't think it's just that the charity sector, you know, needs to think in this way. I think there is something about, certainly in my, my little part of South East London, health leaders recognising that they need to work differently with us and others and communities as well. It's it's not always easy for a big organisation to take the lead because of the, the, the power and also the prejudice that comes with a big organisation when you want to try and create a coalition. And it's, I don't, I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but it's, but it's incredibly difficult for a government agency to take the lead just because they have so many processes and so much culture around procurement and around, you know, buying interventions and this sort of thing that it's very difficult for them to get out of that. But also they have so much power that it's very difficult for them to actually collaborate. They're rubbish at collaborating. So the fact that, you know, you, you don't necessarily feel as though you have a mandate for your organization to take the lead probably tells you that you might actually be a good organization to take the lead. I will just Sylvia first and then Petra. Hi, just an observation, I suppose, in your excellent diagram with different areas of kind of intervention. And uh, I noticed that kind of research is kind of underpinning those triangles. And it really kind of struck me that, you know, research in a way is a public good um, and should be a key part of system stewardship because a lot of charities are maybe too small to conduct a lot of their own research but really this is public knowledge and it does link back to kind of the point you made about having outcomes that are kind of above and beyond us because a lot of those the data might be you know published data government data and how much that underpins things as well so just mm. an observation really no thank you for sharing that um what you find is that within each of those four roles so if I'm an innovation organization, my research and data tends to be all around my innovations. If I'm a service delivery organization, my research and data, if it exists in, you know, in much sense, is about the impact of my interventions. If I am trying to sort of mobilize my intellectual property or my you know, skills and experience across, say, the commercial environment, um, so, you know, I'm trying to persuade employers to employ autistic people, you know, keep coming back to that example, so I like it. Um, then a lot of my research will be about the benefit to employers of employing autistic people and, you know, the scale of, and if I'm trying to, um, trying to influence government, a lot of my research will be at a population level. So what you tend to find is that organizations that do research tend to research with a particular slice in mind and the real value of a, of a sort of system coalition is around how do you join that up? How do you make sense of that? And how do you make sure that the insights go to the right people to help them make better decisions of whatever whatever role they're playing so it's well well observed and i think just to have a, a very quick sort of response to that and i think government has tried to do a little bit of that with the what works centers and and, and i think it's almost like something similar is, is needed um for the charity for some of the areas in the charity sector but anyway that's just a thought it's fine yeah yeah that's absolutely one of the big things that always comes out in what makes what are the difficulties in making um systems change collaborations work is around control 
because you have to be able to kind of go in there with an idea of we think this should be the goal, but actually we've come out with a slightly different goal that everybody can buy into, not just us. And that we think that this is how we work, but actually, no, this isn't how we're working because of, because of. It's, you know, there, there's a degree to which you kind of have to let go of control, a bit like James was saying about the branding. If there's one thing that governments are really, really bad at, it's letting go of control. And that's why it's really hard when, you know, you have government initiatives that pull these things together. I'm not saying it has no value. They can be really valuable, but it's very hard for the system to actually come through when a, when it's a government initiative. It just historically is. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's, you know, it's constrained by just behaviours and the, the natural power of the organisations. So, Petra, you... Yeah, I just really two observations, uh, Martin, one from where I am now at Horse World Trust, and that is thank you for reassuring me that the process doesn't have to be linear. Having just got my board to sign off a new five year strategy, um, I feel there's an opportunity to kind of move into a systems approach in parallel with mm. delivering a five year strategy. And I hadn't seen it like that before. So that's really helpful. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise was just going back to Brooke. And uh, one of the things that we learned um, going through that process, it was a bit like the elephant in the room. And that was looking at your funding model alongside your systems change intent. And we left it a long time before we actually looked at how the two could fit together. Um, and if you are funded primarily on your delivery of services, um, you've got to really transition your support as well as introducing your system change and say we we didn't do that soon enough in my opinion so just an observation uh, a learning really i think that people might find useful absolutely i would underscore that 100 percent that, that as you start on this journey um some organizations will pick this up and they will run with it and it will suit them and they they will they will have a kind of cultural readiness to accept this and they will have an organizational model that can adapt so there's funding streams that can fit. You know, if you've got largely voluntary funding streams or largely commercial income funding streams, that's much more flexible. If your income streams are a lot of um, contracts, then it's much more difficult. If you've got a big asset base of things that are invested in, in certain, you know, service provisions, it's just much, it's not more, it's not difficult, it's not difficult in a sense, but it will just take time for you to really have the proof and the evidence that this is worth making the shift towards and to understand the nuances of that and to model it out financially, to model that out in terms of people impact before you actually sort of go, right, that's it. We're all in on systems change and we're not going to be bothered doing, you know, some of this stuff anymore. Because some of that stuff will survive because some of it will still be stuff that only you can do and is absolutely high impact and, and really works. But it will make you question certain things that you do. And, and I, would, I would sort of echo Petra in terms of, you know, before you, and most trustees would say no anyway, but before you start, you know, slashing the knife and cutting bits out of your organisation, make sure your economic model works in that transition space. We have overrun. Um, if there is more that you'd like to talk about on this, just drop me a note and you can pick my brains anytime. It's an area that I'm really interested in. If you've got experiences that you want to share, I would love to hear them. Um, I think that, I think that my next book will have this stuff in it um so if you've got experiences that you're willing to share talk to me and you may even make it in on page 28 as the little box um so do get in touch and stay in touch and uh it was lovely to see you all thank you all for joining me and hopefully i'll see you at the next one take care